Hi everyone, welcome to worship. Uh, our scripture reading today is going to come from the letter of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The word of God for the people of God. What are we talking about? Practice? We're talking about practice, man. Now, I don't know how many of you are sports fans, but I'm a big sports fan, and, and I'm a big Philadelphia sports fan. And one of Philly's most iconic sports moments, uh, sports speeches, was given by Allen Iverson back in 2002, where again and again he said the word, practice. Now his team, the Philadelphia 76ers, they had just suffered an early exit from the playoffs just one year after almost winning the whole thing. And during his end-of-season press conference, he was asked a few times about comments made by his coach about him missing practice. And so after fielding a few questions on the topic, the press just wouldn't let up until finally he went on his iconic rant. We're sitting here, and I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, listen, we're talking about practice. Not a game, not a game, not a game. We're talking about practice. Not a game. Not the game that I go out there and die for and play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? We're talking about practice. And that's kind of sort of what we are doing this Lenten sermon series. We're talking about practice. Not belief, not living life. No, we're talking about practice. Spiritual practices, to be specific. Spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines. And like Iverson, you might be wondering, why we got to talk about practice? And, and hey, <laughs> look, it's not my fault. No, okay? Uh, blame it on those early Christians. Uh, see, in this book I was reading by Lawrence Stuckey about the church calendar, I learned that this whole spiritual practice of giving things up for Lent is completely the fault of Christians in the first few centuries after Jesus. Uh, see, for converts back then, 40 days was the length of their final intensive preparation for their baptism on Easter. And that intense preparation, it most often included prayer and fasting, uh, which was based off of Jesus' own preparation for ministry by fasting 40 days in the wilderness. And so out of that pattern uh, developed the tradition of Lent, a time of praying and fasting, right? A, a time of sacrifice and subtraction and suffering, and a time of practicing, now, practicing for what, you might ask? Well, basketball players, they practice to hone their skills and prepare for their games. Uh, but the Christians back then, they practiced to hone their faith and prepare for their baptism, uh, to prepare for life, to prepare for walking out their faith and living out their faith. But you see, even after their baptism was complete, they didn't stop practicing. And one great model of this practice-oriented mindset and this practice-oriented life uh, is our own Methodist founder, John Wesley. Uh, the Reverend Stephen Manskar, he wrote an article about how John Wesley uh, practiced fasting for all of his adult life. Uh, he practiced a weekly fast from sundown on Thursday to sundown on Friday. 
And this wasn't just during Lent. This was week after week, year after year, throughout the whole year, and it became a rhythm of his life. And so during that time of fasting, he would refrain from eating food and would drink only water and tea. And he also spent much of those 24 hours praying and reading scripture. And Wesley referred to fasting as a means of grace. And by that, he he means it's an instrument by which the Holy Spirit enables believers to receive Christ and to experience God's grace in their lives. Holy Communion, which we're going to celebrate today at the in-person service, Holy Communion is one such means of grace. And for Wesley, fasting was yet another powerful means of grace, because fasting, for him, you know, it's a, it's a physical self-emptying that connects us with Christ, and it opens our hearts to his grace. On the one hand, it reminds us of our dependence upon God and his grace, right? We depend not on food, but we depend on Christ in our lives. But also, it creates a little extra time in our lives, a time we don't spend eating, which we can then spend in prayer. Still, though, you know, we, we might not be convinced we want to take up fasting ourselves. We might wonder what the big deal is about practice. So, uh, let me put it to you this way. You see, when a basketball player practices dribbling, they do it so that while in a game, they don't even have to think about it. They, they just do it. They just dribble. Their, their body knows what to do. And when they practice shooting, let's say they're practicing catch and, and shoot threes, and they practice it again and again, hundreds, maybe even thousands of times a day, day after day, week after week, year after year, so that while they are in a game, while they are in crunch time, while the shot clock is ticking down, and that ball comes their way and hits their hands, they don't even think about it. Their body just reacts, right, responding to what it has been trained to do. Same catch, same jump, same arm movement and release. It just happens naturally. And then the next day after the game, they go back and practice it again. They practice it again to keep that motion and that rhythm and those reflexes ingrained in their nerves and joints and in the same part of their brain that keeps them breathing without having to consciously think about it and control it. They keep practicing so that their minds and bodies don't tense up in the spotlight as the pressure ramps up. And so what are we, as Christians, what are we going to do when storms come? What are we going to do when we face temptation? What are we going to do when life happens? Most of the time, it becomes hard to think doesn't it? Like, like it becomes difficult to stop and breathe and to really take the time to, to, to really think through the age-old question of what would Jesus do? As our bodies and brains tense up, it is almost like we just react and our spiritual reflexes reveal themselves. Sometimes our minds run to scripture and to our Lord, and other times our minds seem to run the wrong way and get lost in the darkness. And so what are we going to do? right? We are going to do whatever we have prepared to do. We are going to do whatever we have practiced. And so if we don't practice fasting and denying ourselves and praying and listening to Jesus's voice, if we don't practice coming into God's presence, well, then I'm, I'm sure you can guess what we are probably going to do. But it's not so to, it's not just supposed to be fasting and fasting and more fasting. See, our practice is also supposed to include some feasting. Now, we always say that Lent is 40 days of fasting, 40 days of giving something up. But if you get out your calendar and count the days from Ash Wednesday to the day before Easter, you end up with 46 days, not 40. Why? Because Sundays are not fast days. So, whatever you chose to give up and fast from during Lent, you are officially allowed to eat. You are officially allowed to feast on it every Sunday. Uh, now, my friend who gave up meat uh, told me a couple days ago that he is pretty sure he is going to eat meat and only meat uh, each of these Sundays. 
But you see, the reason we, we feast is because every Sunday is considered the day of our Lord. And it is a special day on which we celebrate the coming and resurrection of our Lord, but it is also a special day on which we look forward to the second coming of our Lord. And one way we look forward to it is by feasting. We feast as a way of looking forward to the great heavenly feast that will kick off on that day. Uh, and so during Lent, we fast for six days, and then we feast on Sunday. Fast for six days, feast on Sunday. Fast, feast, fast, feast, and, until it becomes a sort of rhythm in our lives. We fast, and then we feast. We mourn, and then we celebrate. We repent, and then we rejoice. We sacrifice, and then we partake. We suffer, and then we rise. We take a few days to give up small things that bring us temporary happiness. And then we enter Sunday and we catch a glimpse of that eternal, age-like joy that is awaiting us in the age to come when Christ returns. And we do it again and again, feasting and fasting, practicing it again and again and again until it becomes like a natural rhythm, until it becomes a part of us, like breathing in, and out. Now, when it comes to that practice rant by Alan Iverson, I can relate, and I'm sure we all can. Like, sometimes we just don't want to practice. Practice is often not very fun. It's just a lot of hard work. I remember this one time in high school, I discovered my dad had an old guitar, and, and so I got it in my head that I wanted to learn how to play it. But after picking it up and having no clue where to begin and then trying out things here and there, such as trying to learn chords and how to read music, and after my fingers felt a bit sore from pressing down on the strings without having developed any calluses yet, and after beginning to realize how much practice it would take to get anywhere close to competent enough to play a beginner level song or two, after all of that, I put that guitar back in its case and put it back in my dad's closet, because I didn't want to practice. I just wanted to play. I just wanted to be good. Malcolm Gladwell, in his best-selling book, Outliers, once said it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert. And just showing up does not count as deliberate practice. Picking up a guitar and pressing down random strings and strumming it with a pick a few times does not count as deliberate practice. 10,000 hours. How many hours do you think you have put in? That practice rant by Alan Iverson. There's, of course, you know, more to the backstory. There is boiling over frustration, and there's grief over a lost friend. But you see, even in the midst of his rant, he acknowledged the importance of practice. He knew it was important, and he wasn't skipping out on every practice, maybe just one or two that year. But, but you see, the Philadelphia media, they kept hounding him about it. They asked question after question about practice. They wrote articles criticizing him on his attendance and efforts at practice. They had high expectations for him and also for his teammates and for the rest of the Philly athletes, as did the fans and people of Philadelphia. Allen Iverson was representing them. So they expected him to take practice very seriously. Do we hold ourselves to the same standards? After all, aren't we representing God? Aren't, aren't we representing Jesus to the rest of the world? Like, honestly, these, these recent sermons, they're frustrating me because I don't know much about Lent or about fasting. And I've tried fasting before in a couple different contexts and for a couple different reasons. And at times it's gone well and been life-giving. And other times I've just flopped and it lasted only a few hours into a planned 24 or 48-hour fast. So yeah, you know, I'm lacking knowledge and I'm lacking experience. But also I'm frustrated by these sermons because 
I'm not great at practicing either. I'm not even as good at it as I once used to be. I mentioned last week, you know, this is my first time doing Lent in quite a while. And so I'm preaching at you and telling you to do something. And instantly I'm feeling guilty because I'm not setting a good example. And so I know I got to be better. And of course, you know, there is grace, right? There is grace, there is mercy, and that grace and mercy is what we get to remember and taste when we celebrate communion. But, but that's, that's not a reason to not practice. That's not a reason to not do better. Rather, that, that's a reason to try all the harder, right? It, it makes me want to be better for myself, for, for when I face those stormy waters, and it makes me want to be better for all of you, for our church family, as well as for all of Georgetown and the United States, the whole world. Because I want you and I want them to taste the grace and mercy and love of our God too. And above all else, I want to be better for God. I want to love and serve and represent Jesus to the best of my ability. And to do that, I, we, need to practice more. Putting in our hours, starting right now. As you feast today, and as you fast in the days to come, may God meet you where you are. And may you come to know even more the love of Christ. Amen.